When you think of road construction, you probably think of concrete, massive bridges, and year-long delays, all to make wider, faster roads. But this project took a completely different approach. This intersection might look pretty typical, but it proved to be problematic for a few reasons, and something needed to be done. The first problem was the size. This wide turning radius encouraged drivers to take this turn at high speeds and became a dangerous spot for crashes. It was also only controlled by a single stop sign for this direction and had visibility problems for cars trying to turn. Not only was this dangerous, but also delayed cars trying to turn, most of which were turning left. However, due to limited funding and a lack of available space, options were limited to fix the problem. So the city tried an innovative solution, a mini roundabout made of plastic. This roundabout was constructed by installing plastic panels made of recycled milk jugs onto the existing road, changing the entire configuration in the same amount of space. It was built as a pilot project, meaning it could be easily modified or removed if they found it to be unsuccessful, or kept to become permanent if desired. Construction began on installing the plastic panels, and the project was completed in only four days. The roundabout opened to traffic, and the test began to see if it would prove to be successful. Due to the small size, the center island had to be clear of obstacles and traversable to allow for large vehicles to drive over it as they wouldn't be able to make the small turning radius. So, while anyone could technically drive straight through the middle, it would be a pretty abrupt bump, especially at higher speeds. Drivers seem to respect the panels and follow the roundabout as designed. This setup causes everyone to slow down and yield to traffic within the roundabout, creating a slower, safer, and more efficient intersection, solving the problems this intersection previously had. It was completed for a very low cost compared to building a traditional roundabout, and didn't require any additional land. Despite the unconventional construction materials used, it's created real results by improving safety and efficiency in a matter of days. And it turns out, this mini roundabout is just one piece of a toolkit that can be used on roads everywhere to implement small changes in design that slow down drivers and save lives. When people drive, they drive according to their perception of danger. If we perceive less risk, we'll drive faster, and if we perceive more risk, we'll drive slower. This is a crucial part of road design and has a massive impact on speeds. Straight, clear roads with wide lanes signal to drivers that higher speeds are acceptable, whereas curvy, narrow roads with obstacles and visual obstructions signal to drivers that they need to slow down. It might sound counterintuitive, but sometimes perceiving more risk can actually be a good thing for safety, due to the fact that drivers slow down and pay attention. On streets where cars should be going slow, elements that reduce the amount of space where drivers can make mistakes and force them to pay attention can actually end up being safer than a straight, wide open street. This is especially important in places where pedestrians are present, such as residential streets, as that difference in speed can mean life or death if a crash occurs with a pedestrian. And unfortunately, pedestrian deaths are on the rise in the US. There are many contributing reasons that will require policy change or a societal mindset change to fix, such as the ever-increasing size of vehicles or distracted driving, but speed is definitely a key factor of this problem, and thankfully we can use design to help reduce speeds. One road in Cincinnati, Ohio had a huge problem with speed, with recorded speeds reaching 89 miles per hour on this road, full of homes, families, and schools. Thankfully, they decided to do something about it, and their solution has already prevented crashes and saved millions of dollars in only a matter of months. We'll take a deeper look at what they did in a bit, but since speed is such a critical factor in safety, what tools can be used in communities everywhere to decrease speed? The first tool is pretty simple, landscaping. Streets lined with trees and shrubs not only look nice, provide shade, and improve air quality, but they also function as a tool to slow down drivers. They create the perception of a narrower roadway, and drivers become aware there is less room for error. When trees are placed between vehicle lanes and a sidewalk, they also function as a physical boundary between the two, making it an all-around win for better streets. Curb extensions, also called all sorts of other things, extend the curb at intersections further into the road to narrow the roadway. This visual narrowing of the roadway can slow down drivers, and the smaller turning radius reduces the speed at which drivers make turns. Curve extensions also reduce crossing distances for pedestrians, and can increase their visibility within the intersection. This can have a huge impact on pedestrian safety because of a concept called daylighting. On streets with parked cars, any cars parked up to an intersection can block the view of pedestrians, creating blind spots. By bringing the curb further out and eliminating parking next to the crosswalk, Sightlines are greatly improved for both drivers and pedestrians. Some cities have done this just using paint, cones, or flexible bollards as a low-cost way to improve safety and show that it can work before installing a more permanent solution. Curbs can be modified at other points in the streets, too. A chicane is where the roadway intentionally curves by modifying the curb to force drivers to slow down in order to take the turns at a safe speed. This example in Charlotte, North Carolina used to be a standard straight residential street 
but was modified to add curves and slow down drivers. They also added these median islands to the middle of the road for this project, which are another common tool used for traffic calming. The median island creates a physical obstacle in what would otherwise be a wide open road. If you haven't noticed a common theme yet, this gives the visual appearance of narrowed lanes and encourages drivers to slow down, to ensure they can safely make it through the space between the side of the road and the median island. When used with a crosswalk, they reduce crossing distances and function as a refuge for pedestrians to wait and cross each direction of the street separately. While most of these tools so far rely on a level of perception or turning movements, there are some tools that can physically stop speeding. If you've driven anywhere, you've likely been over a speed bump, and while I don't think anyone really likes driving over them, they're cheap to install and can be effective in slowing down drivers to very low speeds. But the speed bump has some variations for when we don't need cars to be at crawling speeds, but still need to keep speeds in check. A speed hump is essentially a longer speed bump. It isn't quite as an abrupt bump and allows for slightly higher vehicle speeds. This makes it more appropriate for residential streets. It also provides a more comfortable experience, provided drivers are traveling at the design speed. Many times, speed humps are placed in a series, ensuring vehicle speeds stay low on the entire road rather than just at a single point. Speed humps aren't without their issues, though. They can delay emergency vehicles, which is less than ideal. However, these larger vehicles have a built-in advantage that make for an incredibly simple solution. Make some gaps in the speed hump. These are speed cushions, and they're designed to reduce delays for emergency vehicles. These larger vehicles have a wider wheelbase than regular cars, meaning they can fit perfectly through the gaps between the speed cushions, and don't have to slow down. Cyclists are also unaffected, as they can go between the gaps. Regular cars will still end up hitting some part of the speed cushion, even if they aim for the gap. Speed tables are even longer than speed humps with a flat section on top, and they're designed for streets with even higher speeds. These can be paired with a crosswalk to create a raised crosswalk, which forces drivers to slow down and brings awareness to pedestrians within the crosswalk since they are higher in the sightline of drivers. This can also be applied to entire intersections, creating raised intersections. This keeps vehicle speeds low throughout the intersection and allows for level crossings, since the crosswalk and the road are at the same height. Typically, there are physical barriers, like bollards or planters, to prevent drivers from entering the sidewalk area. A lot of these tools can be combined as well, creating things like speed tables with median islands or landscape curb extensions. However, it's important to ensure traffic calming tools match the use of the road. While a speed hump might be appropriate to slow down traffic in a residential area, you wouldn't want to put one on a highway. That's because a residential street is made for homes and people, while a highway is for vehicles to get between places quickly. That might seem pretty self-explanatory, but many roads in the US are missing matched in terms of their purpose and their design speed, leading to the infamous strode. A strode is a mix of a street, which is designed for places and people and homes, and a road, which is designed for cars to quickly drive between places. Combining those two ends up with a mix of high-speed cars, several conflict points from turning vehicles, and pedestrians living, shopping, or working at places along the strode. This combination has proven to be incredibly dangerous for everyone. All of the problems regarding strodes have been discussed in depth by many great creators already and could be discussed further in a future video, but let's take a look at what happened with this strode in Cincinnati, Ohio, and how this fix is already proven to improve safety and connectivity by using the final and most versatile tool in our traffic calming toolkit, the road diet. A road diet is the conversion of an existing road to function differently through the reduction of vehicle travel lanes. This can result in a wide variety of outcomes, ranging from the most common four-lane to three-lane conversion, to bike lane additions, to dedicated transit lanes. There are tons of possibilities as to what can be done with a road diet, but one common motive behind any road diet is safety. In the typical four to three-lane conversion, safety improvements are accomplished in a few ways. When we look at an undivided four-lane road like this, these left lanes function as both passing lanes as well as turning lanes for traffic turning left. This means large differences in speed, which can lead to rear-end collisions or drivers having to weave around turning traffic. Having a passing lane available also leads to higher speeds in general, since drivers aren't limited to the speed of the car in front of them. Visibility is also a huge problem for traffic turning left. If two cars are waiting to turn at an intersection, they block the view of any traffic that might be in the rightmost lanes. Meanwhile, in a three-lane setup with two driving lanes and a center turning lane, it allows for all turning traffic to move out of the driving lanes, lowering the risk of rear-end collisions and increasing visibility. At crosswalks, the center turning lane can be built as a median island, creating a pedestrian refuge and shortening the crossing distance. These median islands alone have been shown to reduce pedestrian-related crashes by up to 46%. All of these safety improvements are calculated using a blend of math, data, and engineering. And while concepts in those fields can sometimes feel intimidating or complicated, there's a free and easy way to learn more about concepts in math, science, and data interactively with the sponsor of this video, Brilliant. 
Brilliant has thousands of lessons ranging from how technology works, to modeling data, to scientific thinking, and more. The lessons are hands-on, too, proving to be six times more effective than watching lecture videos. And the cool thing is, is that it's customized to be tailored towards your needs and lets you learn at your own pace. You take a quick quiz when you sign up, and you're matched with courses that fit your skill level allowing you to learn more about what you're interested in, whether you're just starting out or have years of experience. I found the measurement course really interesting as it applies problem-solving techniques using geometry. Geometry is such a critical foundation to design and is something that I always found interesting to learn more about. If you enjoy learning and want to add something fun and productive to your daily routine, you can check out everything Brilliant has to offer for free for 30 days by visiting brilliant.org streetcraft or click on the link in the description. And Brilliant is offering Streetcraft viewers 20% off an annual premium subscription. So if you're looking to start learning something new, check out Brilliant. When vehicle lanes are removed and more space is available, it allows us to completely rethink how people can get around the area and decide if we want it to truly be a road or a street. And in Cincinnati, they decided they were going to turn this road into a street. But it most definitely wasn't before, as it had a major problem. Speeding. This four-lane road had a 35 mile per hour speed limit, but traffic studies revealed that over half of drivers exceeded the speed limit and 20% of drivers exceeded 60 miles per hour. The highest recorded speed was 89 miles per hour, and unfortunately, it was proving to be deadly. You know, these roads were basically built as highways through the, the heart of the neighborhood. This is Matt Butler, president of the DeVue Good Foundation, who was a key part of transforming this street. They were experiencing uh, a lot of reckless driving, so much so that um, many of them were afraid to walk. Neighbors had also complained about drivers driving up into their yards, striking their parked vehicles, uh, crashing into um, rock walls, trees. We met with the neighborhood and we listened to their concerns. We went and walked the streets, we put up radar devices to really get a quantitative measurement of what's going on on the streets and went back and came up with some conceptual designs. They wanted to slow traffic down. The best way to slow traffic down is to reduce the lane width. And so what we did was we removed two of the drive lanes and repurposed them for either full-time parking or um, full-time bike lane. And so these countermeasures like the bike lane are actually making drivers and people in cars a lot safer uh, because they're, they're reducing the speed of all the other drivers around. The other great thing about the bike lane is it's, you know, it's usable infrastructure that everybody can use. And the project has already shown that it's working. Roadway data says that reckless speeding over 50 miles per hour has been reduced by 90%, crashes overall have decreased by 30%, and the severity of those crashes has greatly decreased with a 93% reduction in injury. This project was done as an interim solution to show what can be done with less expensive construction materials while still creating real results. It's designed to last, say, at least five or seven years, and we figured that would give not only College Hill, but it would give uh, other communities the opportunity to see these in action. Um, and we wanted to make sure that it functioned really well, that people were really safe, and that it was uh, low maintenance. There's a huge backlog of maintenance on all of our roads, um, billions of dollars. And uh, unfortunately, as a society, we've prioritized just building new things and uh, at the expense of maintaining what we already have. So we should be fixing it first. Um, in this case, communities can do this pretty quickly without a lot of money. The other advantage of it is, is that if something isn't working exactly right, then you can make adjustments on the fly. And we did that because we needed to accommodate school bus turning movements. And if this was made out of, say, permanent uh, poured concrete, that would have been, you know, an extremely costly fix. Instead, it was just the contractor basically working with the engineer to kind of move things around a little bit, and they were able to, you know, make modifications in a day. Not only has this project improved the street, but it's essentially already paid itself off, just from how much money has been saved with the cost of crashes. The federal government assigns a monetary value to each different type of crash. Many factors go into the total cost of a crash, from the obvious vehicle repair costs, to hospital bills, to lost wages, and the list goes on. With that data, they were able to look at crash data from before and after the improvements and calculate the money saved. In our case, we just looked at it over a few months, but that was enough time to kind of give us a sense. So our $500,000 that we spent saved about $5 million just in a short few months, according to the federal government's calculations. Since we were able to basically just place these on top of the street, our costs were extremely low. So our payback for the neighborhood was 
you know, within a matter of like a month and a half or something like that. So it was pretty astounding. With the changes they were able to create, I asked Matt what the next step should look like for anyone wanting change in their own community. They need to be persistent um, and they need to, at least in the city of Cincinnati, they need to get involved in their community council, uh, speak to their elected officials, go to um, council meetings and speak up and say that these are the type of things that that they want. And there's a lot of changes that need to happen. When we started this about four years ago, the budget at the city of Cincinnati for traffic calming was about $500,000. Um, and now it's $10 million. It's still a very small amount, but it's um, much, much bigger than what it was just four years ago. Uh, so I think, you know, change is possible, but, um, you know, people have to speak up and uh, organize themselves with others. Um, and, you know, don't be discouraged. If you get a no, then, you know, Go back and find out how can we get to a yes. So whether it's a plastic roundabout or a total street renovation, change is happening in communities all over, and it's important to keep fighting for safer streets for all. This next video reimagines what streets in the suburbs could look like and dives deeper into some of the problems they currently have. If you liked this video, be sure to subscribe and check out our Patreon to help support creating more videos like this.